All right, we may as well make a start. So my name is Russell Thompson. I'm an Associate Professor in Economics at the Centre for Transformative Innovation here at Swinburne University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you tonight to launch Economic Innovations, uh, this wonderful book written by Professor Beth Webster and Bill Scales. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of, of the land on which we meet today, uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I recognise their continued connection to this land and that sovereignty was never ceded. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and any First Nations people here today. So today, uh, the schedule, you'll be sitting down for about an hour. Um, uh, in a moment, I'll uh, invite John Fain up to officially launch the book. Um, and then we'll have a, a, a round table here. Uh, I'll pepper them with a few questions. Um, after that, I'll try and allow uh, a little bit of time for questions from uh, the audience. Um, and after the formal part of the proceedings tonight, uh, please join us in the foyer downstairs for uh, refreshments um, and to continue conversation. Um, and just before I begin, uh, can I just make sure you check your phones are off or on silent? So the easy part, introducing John Fain. John's a man who probably needs very little introduction to anybody who lives in Melbourne, over about 15. John's a solicitor by trade, and he made his foray into radio in 1989, writing and presenting the Law Report on ABC Melbourne. Uh, and clearly he found his forte, and that was talking. By 1996, uh, John was talking to Melbourne for hours each and every weekday as the host of the morning program on the ABC. John was so good at presenting the morning program that it took the ABC 23 years to find someone better to replace him. Um, now, I, I, I personally, I really enjoyed John's morning program. Uh, I used to listen to it every time I drove uh, to work here at Swinburne from Brunswick. Um, John has a well-deserved reputation for fostering agenda setting deba debate. Uh, he certainly didn't shy from controversy, famously once asking a prime minister, how come you say so many stupid things? I Googled, I had to check, it wasn't Scott Morrison. <laughs> Equally importantly, in my opinion, he didn't gratuitously court controversy. And I think uh, that probably his contribution to policy over the 23 years would be more in a, more in a, book, more in a story of itself. In 2003, he received Broadcaster of the Year Award from ABC Melbourne and was made a member of the Order of Australia in 2019. And nowadays, as well as launching books on economic innovation, uh, he's a vice chancellor's fellow at the University of Melbourne and a regular columnist on the, in the age. So over to you, John. Thank you. Thank you. That's very generous of you. And um, I feel like a fraud. I'd also like to acknowledge that we're on the lands of the Kulin Nation, the Wurundjeri, the uh, Bunurung and the Watharong people. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and also express my personal impatience for a treaty or treaties to try and repair just some of the damage of our colonial past, without which I'm personally quite convinced that as a country, we're a bit stuck, which takes me to page two of this excellent book about economic innovation. And I'm sorry, Beth, it's not a great way to launch a book by starting off pointing out that on page two, it says, although Australia has avoided the scourge of famine and war has not been fought on Australian soil. And the mythology surrounding the colonial settlement of Terra Australis, I think has to be challenged. And that's what we were taught. That is what we were taught and we weren't taught the truth. And until we get into truth telling and it's going to be painful on many levels, until we get into it, we can't progress. But I thought I'd just prove to you I'd actually read your book. <laughs> At least two pages of it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I did read the whole thing and I found it really interesting and I feel absolutely humbled and completely unqualified to be standing here and launching a book which covers so much interesting ground and in a digestible way, whether it's the PBS or any of the other different innovations that have been studied by these two distinguished authors. 
And I'm uniquely qualified to talk about it because I didn't even do maths in sixth form at school. In fact, um, Denny Meadows, who was at Melbourne High at the same time, sitting over there behind the mask, um, may have been told the same thing. I was asked not to do maths in sixth form because I would have brought the school's averages down and they were rather proud of their academic achievements. So I didn't do it. And I never understood economics either. And when I had to learn how to reconcile a trust account in order to be qualified as a solicitor, I think it was probably the single hardest part of my entire five-year course. But we got through, we got through. But this isn't a book about economics. And I'm asked to speak about the intersection between economics and public policy. And I know nothing about economics, so I can only talk about public policy. But the role of economics in getting stuff changed and making the world progress is sort of self-evident. And so the job for the economist is not just to understand vertical fiscal imbalance, but to be able to tell the story of why it matters. And I'm absolutely sure whether you're a brain surgeon or an economist or a panel beater, doesn't matter what you do in life you have to be able to tell its story. If the panel beater can't explain to me why my car's gonna cost $10,000 to get fixed, I'm not gonna approve it. And if the brain surgeon wants to cut my head open and won't tell me why, I'm not gonna give consent. But likewise, if the economist wants us to forego wages or accept higher interest rates, it's not enough anymore to simply say, look at all the letters after my name, now shut up and believe me. Trust me, no one does. That is, trust me, that no one trusts anyone. People now, they want to subject everything to scrutiny. And as we've seen with this election campaign that we've all just survived, we don't know who to trust anymore. We don't know whether we should trust priests. Or well, we know we have every reason to wonder whether they, in fact, should be taken as being the custodians of moral values in our society. It will take generations for them to recover, quite rightly, along with people who run scout groups and sporting groups and so on. There was a whole Royal Commission that established just how untrustworthy some of those people in positions of so-called authority really are. We've never trusted politicians, and our default position is not to trust them until they earn our trust. And I suspect we don't trust bankers, and we had another Royal Commission to tell us why, and we're exposed to all sorts of unbelievable accounts, both anecdotal and driven by data. We've had Royal Commissions of Inquiry into everything from nursing homes to child protection. And you, know, you could go through the alphabet and find more and more. So in order to establish trust, to, to create the cohesion that will get people to accept that they have to do things that they otherwise might not want to do, you have to be able to tell a story. You have to be able to persuade people. And you can use carrots and you can use sticks. But best of all, you can tell a story. And that's what the media should be doing. But unfortunately, and we've just seen ample demonstration of this in the last six weeks in Victoria, there are a large element of the media who don't want to offer you stories. Instead, they want to tell you what to think. And thank goodness it hasn't worked. There was that triumphant moment. I don't know if you were like us on Saturday night, bored with the ABC's presentation, sick of Anthony Green, the ABC's tame election gnome, jumping up and down like a ever-ready bunny. And we switched over and we got to Channel 7 just in time to hear Steve Brax and Jeff Kenneth engaged. Did anybody else see it? It was absolutely priceless. Jeff was saying, oh, this is going to be a referendum on Dan Andrews and Braxy half an hour later going, well, you got your referendum on Dan Andrews, Jeff, do you accept it now? He went, no, 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 it hasn't been run properly. <laughs> what do you do? What do you do? And then courtesy of Twitter, I've seen some of the extracts from Sky News and I don't subscribe. We don't pay Rupert to watch this drivel, so I don't see Sky. But there were some priceless moments. There was Michael Kroger rabbiting on about how Dan Andrews still hasn't told the truth about what happened when he fell down the steps and hurt his back. <laughs> and he's baiting Lisa Neville, who was the Minister for Police in the government, 
one of Dan Andrews' closest confidants is sitting next to him. She deserves a fucking medal for not throttling him, quite frankly. Oops, I just swore. Sorry, that went out on the stream. And uh, it's just unbelievable. So some of these people are behaving in a way that is nothing short of disgraceful. There's no other way to describe it. The Herald Sun, you know, perhaps he looked down the barrow, barrel of the camera. He got all excited and fired up and he said, I'll tell you what. And he went through the outcome and he said, Herald Sun, you have no influence. <laughs> well, they haven't for ages, is the truth. They haven't for ages. But now, as the tide goes out, you can see who's been swimming naked. You can see, absolutely, you can see how completely surreal their claim to speak on behalf of more than a fraction of the population of the state, let alone of Melbourne. It's absurd. So the Murdoch media were the big losers along with Matthew Guy. And a bloke called Neil Mitchell apparently was all devastated too. I can't tell you how heartbroken I am, but still. <laughs> Back to storytelling. The reason the outcome of this election was so convincing is because one side could tell a cohesive and coherent story and the other side couldn't and didn't. I have it on good authority from a, a leak deep within the bowels of the Liberal Party. Thursday afternoon, they were squabbling with each other about their transition to government plan in Matthew Guy's office. And the different people were arguing over who was going to be in charge, with one of them saying to the other, if you don't do what I tell you, you won't have a job in the Premier's office. Which turned out to be quite true. They, none of them have got a job <laughs> in the Premier's office. Nor will they ever, if they keep going this way. They couldn't tell a story. And the reason they couldn't tell a story is because they didn't have one to tell. And already their blame is all about campaign strategies and advertising and tactics and marketing and polling and pre-selections, everything except the one thing that mattered, policy. And the last time the Liberal Party in Victoria had a good idea was about 1997. It wasn't a very good one, so they've decided they won't have them anymore. <laughs> so they just haven't got a clue, and they deserve the irrelevance that they are now finding themselves in. They're going to be like the Labor Party during the DLP era. They are reduced to a rump. They're unelectable. It's at least eight, if not 12 years, before they come to their senses, and maybe even longer, if they can't rid themselves of the religious insurgents who have taken over entire branches of the Liberal Party. They are not a party that can form government in anybody's eyes. Although I might say, don't underestimate the capacity of the Labor Party to implode, to tear itself apart and to lose its senses just when it's all there to be done. So coming back to storytelling, whether you're an economist or whether you're a politician or whether you're a brain surgeon or a panel beater, you have to be able to tell a story. So you get a book, which is unfortunately published for an academic audience. It should be published for a general audience because people want to know the stories of some of these innovations. They need to know how we got there because fundamentally people have to understand that progress is neither linear nor inevitable. It doesn't just happen. People make it happen. Fiona Patton made it happen in Victoria in the last term of the Andrews government Although the government were very happy to claim the credit for a lot of those things, it was Fiona Patton who demanded it for her vote in the upper house. It's going to be interesting. She's on a knife edge at the moment. We'll see whether she survives or not. But anything could happen. But ironically, I thought that the upper house was going to be beholden to a bunch of right-wing idiots. It looks like it might be beholden to a bunch of left-wing idiots instead. <laughs> but either way, we're going to have a fractious upper house and the government's going to have to be negotiating with them and we'll see. But the prospect of progress just happening has to be banished. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. In fact, we can even see in the last nine years of the shambles that became the Abbott, Turnbull and then Morrison government's time in office in Canberra, we saw nothing happen. Every prime minister in living memory, you can go back to Gough even before, you can summarise what they did in a word or two. I mean, you know, you can go, oh, John Howard, oh, yeah, GST, guns, pretty good. It's not bad. He was there a long time, but he actually got shit done. And you can keep on going. Let's go from Howard. We can go, we can go to Keating. I mean, you know, all sorts of stuff. The, 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 the Redfern speech, floating the dollar, all sorts of stuff. You can go all the way through every prime minister. You know, Julia Gillard, well, the NDIS for a start. The misogyny speech, that'll go down forever. 
and you can go through every single prime minister and they at least stood for something. Turnbull, well, he got the same sex marriage thing done, although in a terribly awkward, painful and probably unnecessarily conflicting way. You can pretty much measure every prime minister, but ask yourself, what did Morrison achieve? Totally wasted his time in office. No legacy, nothing. So progress doesn't just happen. It happens when some people step forward and force it to happen. And economists have a vital role to play in telling that story and making sure that those important developments actually can be justified and can take place. So the economic argument for treaty, who's working on it? Because without that analysis, someone somewhere is going to say, oh, no, it's going to be bad for this reason or that reason. You have to blow them up. And you have to pick every single area of government initiative or community progress as part of the license, the social license that the economist claims, that the university claims, that the economist has to serve the community. The main part of it I'd put to you is storytelling, to tell the story of economics. And to do so, you need to be able to speak plain English. And to explain complex ideas in plain English, you have to really deeply understand them yourself. And that's the job of the university. So I congratulate you both, not just for your lifetimes of work, but for being prepared to tell the stories of some of those great social developments that we've been so lucky to have the benefit of. I commend the book to you all, to Beth, to Bill, congratulations, and I'm launching it into the world. <laughs> and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you for coming along. Fantastic. Thanks, John. All right. So now uh, we've got a few, just to have a discussion about the book. Uh, Beth, Bill, it, terrific book. I can personally say I really enjoyed reading it. 110 pages long, and I, I really, it, it packs a real punch. You're covering 150 years of the major economic policies and the sort of trials and tribulations to, uh, to, to, to get them through. So this is about you know, viewing economic policy as an innovation, as an invention, going down an innovation pathway. So my first question, Beth, is to you. Innovations start with an idea. Where do the ideas for economic innovations come from? And does their, their origin have much of a bearing on where they end up? Um, so there's a, there's a few common threads when we looked at, we did 21 case studies just to let people know. I mean, what, what we basically said is that ideas are sort of in some ways cheap. What's the hard part is actually getting ideas taken up and implemented. So that was sort of our starting point. And we also said, okay, we're going to do a whole lot of stories because I, I think as John's very eloquently uh, discussed, people really relate to stories, they understand stories. Give them tables and graphs and, you know, you just lose, you know, 90% of people. Give them a story and they can relate to it. So what we did is we chose 21 stories and they were they were biased because there were stories that we, we both had some personal connection with, but there were stories where um, Australia had actually... Uh, either led the world or really done a step change in being innovative and improving what was before. And, and then when we got all the stories together, we sat down and looked at, well, what are the common threads across all the stories? And, that, and just in terms of where did the ideas come from? It's a long way of getting to answer your question, Russell. So there was a few common threads. Now, a lot of the things that were introduced, like the old age pension, um, uh, so health insurance, um, redu reduction in tariffs. They, they came from a lot of um, social schools of social liberal thought in Britain from the mid 19th century. We can trace them very clearly back to, you know, David Ricardo, um, or even in Germany, Bismarck and what have you. So there's actually a lot of um, thought fermenting underneath uh, a lot of these innovations that suddenly sprang out of nowhere and appeared in Australia. Um, the second uh, area where a lot of uh, ideas came from is there's a crisis happening. And so people, you know, like the millennium drought, um, the, the depression of the 1890s when a lot of people were unemployed and a lot of people who had never been in a job were 
without income and, and were in dire poverty. So there's a crisis. So people actually had to really look at what was done elsewhere and then innovations to suit the Australian landscape. So that's true as well. But also we found that, especially in recent times, a lot of the ideas sprang from a change in technology that suddenly allowed certain things to happen which couldn't happen before. And particularly in the last, say, maybe 30, 40 years, a lot of that's digital technologies making things happen. So, you know, hex help, which we're all familiar with, could not happen without computers and the ability of the tax office to link people who'd, who'd taken out loans, done degrees and then garnish their wages throughout their lifetime. Medicare could not happen without computers. Um, job... debt couldn't <laughs> <happen>. <laughs> Thank you, John. I'm not saying all these things are great. I'm just saying that they, they were uh, operational. Yeah. They could happen. Uh, the job network couldn't happen without it. The PBS couldn't happen without it. So I guess that's a sort of a clue as to where things will go in the future. Where, in terms of which sector, where did the ideas come from? Well, they didn't all come from universities, but quite a lot did. But often the universities didn't really take them forward. They sort of landed them there and they really couldn't take them into the public domain and into the public discourse and get them implemented. Um, but you find, you know, odd things like, the NDIS went back to a New Zealand judge in the 1960s. That's where the idea of the NDIS came from. Golf Whitlam picked it up. He was about to do it, and then he got sacked in 1975. Um, so really, ideas can come from a lot of places. Um, you know, it's certainly not uh, the, the citadel of the university that generates all good ideas. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned that, and sure, sorry, I will say that, you know, I'm going to ask each of you questions, but please, everybody jump in, and if you've got something to add to it, to that one, then throw it in. But, you know, you mentioned that, um, John, that, um, uh, you know, they're not, you, know, you mentioned robo-debt, they're not all good ideas. So, you know, after the idea comes to comes to the, to the fore, it faces resistance, right? And to some extent, that's a good thing. To some extent, bad ideas shouldn't flourish. Um, and in the book, you talk about vested interests. There's, a, there's an interesting line there where you say, uh, private insurance was great for doctors, but not particularly great for patients. And you think about that in terms of, in terms of you know, the health policy overall. So I want to ask you, John, is it sensible to, 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 to distinguish between vested interests in a sort of pejorative sense and you know, sort of valid concerns that are competing that we need to somehow compromise between or sort of, you know, legitimate grassroots or, or concerns of various, various interests. I think it was Paul Keating, wasn't it? He said, always back self-interest, at least you know it's trying. <laughs> and uh, there's no doubt the great tectonic plates that move around in politics are by and large self-interest. So, you know, the National Party today announced that they were going to formally oppose the voice. Um, have a look at who they represent. And it's really interesting that the Victorian National Party, supposedly of the same gene pool, strongly supported treaty and told the Liberals in the coalition in Victoria halfway through the last term of Parliament, it was the Nats who said to the Libs, you have to support treaty. You don't have Indigenous constituents in your electorates, but we do. And this matters to us. And we're asking you to come with us to support treaty so that it's got bipartisan support in Victoria. So what's the difference between the Victorian Nats and the federal Nats? Anybody? <laughs> The difference is that the Victorian Nats represent farmers, the federal Nats represent miners. It's not a national farming constituency that they're talking about. They represent the mining lobby. They've been completely overtaken by the resources sector. So you're getting these really interesting different moves that take place in Australian politics today. And it's gonna to be, to answer your question, it's gonna be fascinating to see which ones prevail. Um, insofar as I'll make a prediction, the government will unleash a massive campaign in the new year for The Voice. It will run all year. It's already got somewhere around 65 to 70% support. Uh, the Greens have to work out how they can, on the one hand, say that Lydia Thorpe is their guiding light on Indigenous policy, but we're not going to listen to her on this. 
because I'll remind people if you weren't aware, if you were aware, I'll remind you. If you weren't, if you weren't aware, if you were aware, I'll remind you. If you weren't aware, I'll tell you. Lydia Thorpe walked out on the voice on the, the Uluru meeting of Indigenous leaders from around Australia. She led a walk out of about a half a dozen people. And in the same way as when she swore her oath of office in the Victorian Parliament, she stumbled when she was the member for Northcote and everyone put it down to nerves. The second time when she took an oath of office, when she was first taken in as a senator, she stumbled. Everyone put it down to nerves. She was so pissed off because no one noticed that she was subverting the oath. So the third time when she was re-elected in her own right this time, not as a casual vacancy in the Senate, but as an elected senator for Victoria, she did the whole fist in the air colonising Queen stunt so that everyone really noticed that she was undermining the oath of office. She doesn't accept the constitution. So you've got that element. And around the back of the shelter sheds, she and Jacinta Price meet up, coming from the extreme right and the extreme left. I mean, Jacinta Price, who is elected on the votes of white constituents in Darwin and Alice Springs, and has almost zero votes in the remote polling booths of remote Australia and Aboriginal Australia. I've just spent three weeks going through the Australian Electoral Commission reports from the Northern Territory for the last federal election and this federal election, and then matching them up to the travel schedule of 19 mobile polling uh, teams who travel around the Northern Territory and go to remote communities and tallying up the votes. And I've just given this to the age and I hope they use it. Jacinta Price was the candidate against Warren Snowden at the last federal election for the seat of Lingiari in the federal election. She didn't win, obviously. She then went into the Senate and this election, because she was a senator, there was a different candidate running for the Liberal National Party, a country Liberal Party in, Queen, in Northern Territory in Lingiari. It was a white man running this time compared to when she ran last time, which was as a black woman. There was a swing against her party in this election, but he considerably outpolled her in Aboriginal communities this time, this year, compared to the votes she got in those remote polling booths last election. I'll say it more clearly, a white man with a swing against the party got more votes in remote Aboriginal communities than Jacinta Price did an, an election ago. And she claims to speak on behalf of the people, they don't vote for her. White people in Alice Springs and Darwin vote for her. And she's claiming to steer the National Party on what's good or bad for remote Australia. It's hilarious, but it's also tragic. It's a circuitous way of illustrating, tell, telling a story to illustrate a point about progress. Uh Russell, you make a really important point, I think, and I think his, history sort of tells us that somehow <clears throat> Australia has been able to balance these single interests. And in, our, in the book, what we try and describe is how this happens in almost a, sort of both in a policy and ideas way as well as it does in an organisational way. For example, we talk about uh, the Grants Commission. Most people don't know what the Grants Commission is. The Grants Commission is this wonderful organisation that every year sits down and tries to find a way, today anyway, at dividing up the GST and divides it up so that effectively what its job is to find a way so that every state has enough resources to provide the average of services across the country. Now, it doesn't mean that every state will provide those services, but that's what they get the money to do. Why is that important? It's important because what we've done over history is to be able to find a way by which we sort of moderate the excesses and find a way by which we provide to the Australian people the opportunity to be treated equally. Uh, the other interesting example is the way by which the industrial relations system developed. Uh, most people know the story of Higgins and the harvester case. What most people won't know is the harvester case wasn't actually about an industrial dispute. It was actually about a situation where 
uh, the government of the day put in place what they call new protection. A new protection was to combine two things. It was to provide full employment at the time of federation combined with high wages. But what they didn't say to anybody, including the parliament, was what do we mean by a high wage? So they then sent it off to what was then the very first of the high court or the, the industrial court that was an element of the high court. And Higgins had to decide what was a fair wage. And this is, again, covers one of the points that you made, this idea of ideas. But there was an idea here that took hold in Australia that said a working person should get a fair wage. And that became the idea that is still part of, effectively, Australia's industrial relations system. So what we tried to do in the book is to actually combine these ideas in a way which says, look what Australia has actually been able to do. In all sorts of interesting ways, we've been able to find a way by which we moderate excesses and actually create a community that finds a way of supporting each other. And there are other examples that Beth has written about, I think, quite eloquently about PBS and others. So I think you raise a really important point. And you introduce us to the idea not just of vertical fiscal imbalance, but horizontal fiscal equality. And I'd never heard that before. Equity, no, sorry. Equity. Yeah, yeah, equity. And I, I'd never heard that before. And I thought, wow, okay. So there's other ways of using the same information, but just arranging it differently. That's right. It was great. I mean, the harvester judgment's interesting, right? Because it's a, it's a judge making making that decision, making that massive piece of policy. And so I I have a, a question just to, as to who in um, you know, sorry, Bill. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to ask you about the dissenting <laughs> opinion of the high court. <laughs> no. no, but so you know, the leadership comes from a lot of different quarters, right? You know, you, you've got you've got political leadership. You've got in this case a judge, and I don't know the, the resistance that faced subsequently. But you know, how important is political leadership in this space when we've got that example that's a judge and is political leadership absolutely central versus... Well, well, it certainly was. Leadership? Well, it was in the Harvester case mm -hmm. because the effect of the Harvester case actually began almost back in the, in the 1880s and 70s mm -hmm. where there was a movement to basically say, how do we find a way by which we moderated the excesses of the employers but not provide excessive wages and, wages and salaries to actually create this sort of balance? So even though there was this idea that came out of the harvester case, it actually had a gestation period of almost 50 years. And in some ways, we forget that. We forget that these great ideas often take time to take hold. But it's also a very good reason why we actually have to have an environment where ideas can be debated and discussed so they can take hold in time. So, so I, I would say in... In a lot of cases, the politicians really came in at the 11th hour and just kicked it along. Like you can see, Paul Keating did that quite effectively when they, when you know when they were trying to bring in the um, scheme whereby non-custodial parents had to pay for their children, and 30 we know 30 percent of them weren't paying for their children uh, before the mm -hmm. 1980s. Um, so they brought in a scheme to garnish their wages to, and send the money directly to the, the custodial parent. There was huge resistance to that particular, and a lot of work done by people inside the bureaucracy and in civil society and what have you to get that what seemed like a really simple, obvious uh, bit of re re reformation, uh, reform across. Uh, Paul Keating came in and just sort of kicked heads and got it done because there were people blocking it. And, and that's true, you know, I think Whitlam was great at picking up other people's ideas and making it his own. Uh, but there are other politicians who really rolled their sleeves up and did a lot. Brian Howe, uh, Bill Hayden, Bill Shorten, they're all really, really, you know, they got in there and did the hard yards going around, and, you know, Ross Garneau with the, the carbon tax and, and, and what have you, which is not successful yet as yet. But they, they really... Um, rolled their sleeves up and did the hard yards going around talking to town halls and to, on, on radio, talking to people like John probably, um, and trying to convince the uh, electorate or the community almost one by one of what they had to do. So I think it, I think it really depended. But most of the reforms we looked at, I think, required at the ultimate end 
a senior politician to really just do that last kick through? Sure. Um, there's a few at state level too, voluntary assisted dying. Yeah. You know, it took Dan Andrews' father to die and for him to witness his own father's death to make him change his mind mm. and decide this is something we have to do and I'm in a position to do it. And it's really sometimes it's serendipitous. A, a really interesting example of that, and this will surprise people, is we've written about the Murray-Darling Basin and the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. And, I mean, that's... Uh, uh, the World Bank actually regards what we're doing in the Murray-Darling Basin as being at the leading edge. Now, we don't argue that it's perfect. We don't do that at all. We're not trying to say that. But what we're trying to actually argue is that uh, often we in Australia don't actually understand where we are at the leading edge of some of these issues. But to take it back to Russell's point, most people won't know that the Murray-Darling, the managing of the Murray-Darling was getting into all sorts of difficulties and it was actually Howard and Turnbull, who actually, Malcolm Turnbull, who did some quite imaginative things to actually bring people together during that period to actually do some quite innovative things around uh, 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 ensuring that everybody's voice was heard in discussions about the Murray-Darling Darling Basin, including Australia's first people for the first time. And so uh, there are some, re and so your point is absolutely right. Eventually, you do need to actually have strong political leadership. I'll give you another example, which we talk about in the book, and that is around Australia's retirement living. Uh, again, the World Bank basically says Australia is again at the leading edge around re retirement living for three for a reason, and that is because we're one of the few that has personal savings, we have a superannuation scheme. We have a pension scheme. Very few countries have those. The superannuation scheme, of course, is credited to Kelty and Keating, and they were very important to get it kicked off universally. But, of course, it actually came from the builders' unions. The builders' unions were the very first to introduce effectively uh, 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 superannuation at, uh, at, at the occupational level. And, uh, and, and they did it and eventually had to drag the employers, the building employers, to become part of that. And then, of course, Keating and Kelty took that up and made it a universal application. You needed the politician to take it further than just one, one industry sector. We've got the unions, we've got civil society, we've got politicians. What about the business leaders? Where are the business leaders in this in this process? Are there examples in your book where the capital owners? I'm just question for everybody. Where where where, where the capital owners have been championing public good uh, policies, the policies to solve your collective problems? Yeah. Jean, Jean has done some fabulous poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Unintentionally, no, no, she's a poet. Oh, okay. She has. Do people know this? Gina, Gina has poetry chiselled into rocks. At her mind sites. Do, do you not know about this? I've only seen Magnus Adowski do that. No, it's, it's absolute doggerel. It's hilarious. Look it up. There's YouTubes on it. It's it's just it's as bad as the Governor General's wife bursting into song at functions. Do you know about that too? <laughs> we have a national embarrassment at the moment. I mean, not only is it that they're the Queen's or well, sorry, the King's representatives, but the Governor General, David Hurley's wife, used to be a sort of, I don't know, singing teacher or something, and they'll be entertaining the, you know, the King of Tonga or somewhere, and she'll get up and sing a song. And it's often one that she's written herself, and it's about as bad as Gina's poetry. You bag Twitter, but yet you clearly spend a bit of time on it, John. Oh, no, you don't, you don't need Twitter for this stuff. Uh, it, it is there. You've got a direct book. line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we don't actually talk about it in the book, but uh, drawing on some of my experiences, it's interesting to know that, for example, the button car plan, which was one element of the one, of one of the matters which we discussed, which is the, the, the sort of tariff reduction program broadly based, but uh, the, the, the industry itself was highly supportive of that because they could see that the, the uh, almost incoherent policies that have gone on for almost 80 years were getting nowhere. And they needed to be part of that process. 
Now, they weren't the drivers. There's no question about that because Button had to basically tell them, don't come to me with your normal gripes. We're going to get on with this. But once they saw the writing on the wall, at least, at least one or two of them became involved in that reform program. And then we had a viable automotive industry until Joe Hockey and Tony Abbott killed it. And when Dennis Napthine was running for re-election in Victoria, Tony Abbott was the Prime Minister. The dollar was at parity. And Tony Abbott came to Melbourne with Peter Credlin pushing him with a cattle prod to a function for journalists up at Treasury. And about 10 of us or 12 of us were invited and we were told he had an hour and he'd worked the room. He arrived 15 minutes late. He walked in. He walked straight over to Andrew Bolt. Spent 15 minutes whispering into Andrew Bolt's ear in some loving embrace with each other. And then Peter Credlin peeled herself off. She was talking to Barry Cassidy and me, and she walked across and she grabbed Tony almost by the ear. It was hilarious and said, you've got to work the room. We've got to leave in 15 minutes. So he went and talked to the age and then he talked to the Herald Sun. And then he, as he was leaving, came to the three ABC people who were there, who were Raph Epstein, Barry Cassidy and me. I, somewhat theatrically trying to get him not to leave, went down on one knee and said, my liege, my liege, which he enjoyed and said, yeah, come on. This is, this is the man who did the wink a few weeks before live to wear and got into terrible trouble when he, he told a woman who called in on talkback that she, she told him that the pension was so low she had to work on a phone sex line to supplement it. And he gave me this leery schoolboy wink, which went viral. And then Julie Bishop said, oh, that's because the presenter winked at him. He winked back, which was a total lie. And Julie Bishop just forgot that I had a microphone too. So I could say that's a lie. And she was humiliated. But leaving that aside, I'm getting distracted. Tony Abbott comes over. He says hello to Barry and to me and to Raf. And then I say to him, look, I know you're leaving, but I've just got one question for you. If, you want, if you're here to help Dennis Napthine, the only thing you need to do to help the Liberal Party here in Victoria, you won't do. Why won't you put some money into public transport? Now, he was leaving. He was turning as he spoke. He gave no thought to his answer, and he just said, oh, too many unions, and then walked out of the room. And I'm not often stuck for words, but here we had a Prime Minister saying he would not put money in Victoria into essential infrastructure because it employed a unionised workforce. Let's go back to the car industry. That is exactly the same reason they were happy to kill the automotive industry. And they told Mike Devereaux, the general manager of Holden, exactly that. We don't like you because you empower unions. You have a heavily unionised workforce. The unions have to be stopped. We won't support you. They seized that moment when the dollar was at parity. And Joe Hockey in Parliament said, are you staying or are you going? And dared them to go. Every country in the world with a car industry supports it because they understand how important it is to the economy. We killed ours because of the government of the day's hatred of unionised workforces. Kill, kill, the, kill the industry to kill the unions. Yep. Um, um, Beth, can I yeah. bring you in? Yeah. Um, so something, a topic close to my heart, which is, you know, we're, we're talking about how you overcome resistance to these ideas, and that's the role of universities. You know, you talked before about them being, you know, part of the genesis of the idea, this sort of, you know, that, that Payne said that, you know, even practical people think they're immune are actually slaves to some defunct economist. But do, do universities have a, a bigger role than that to, to facilitate ongoing change? So it's, it's I would... Not limit it to universities because there's a lot of other bodies out there who do good work. But I think certainly um, <clears throat> objective evidence being brought to bear over repeatedly and um, over time again and again and again on a particular issue um, does have an effect of, of changing people's minds because a lot of the beneficiaries because for, for a lot of innovations, a lot of reforms, are very thinly spread and they can't see the counterfactual. They can't see what they're missing out on uh, by not having that reform. So it, I think, you know, like the, the conversion to metric, you know, they, they, they use, there's a lot of evidence there about the saving to the economy from using, going from imperial to metric. Um, evidence was used to bear with the child support, with Medicare, um, with certainly with tariffs, the cost to consumers of the very high tariff law. We went from 
having the highest tariffs in the developed world at 30% on average down to less than 1% in a period of 25 years. So I think that, that's incredibly important as well as just socialising and, and using, uh, knowing, knowing who you have to convince. Um, and, and the media is obviously very important there in terms of getting the message out. Um, I mean, it, it, the, the poverty line wouldn't be, we wouldn't know anything about it without, without the Henderson poverty line coming out of the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research. Uh, almost the, the, the most powerful tool in social policy today is HILDA. HILDA is a data set. And that data set collects, uh, it's a longitudinal data set that has, I think, 20,000 people in the data set. And it actually measures, as longitudinal studies do, the same cohort each year to determine what's happening with their lives. That is used almost now universally across social policy. It's used to try and understand, for example, the extent to which young uh, unmarried mums are always unemployed. And the answer is they're not, surprisingly. They, 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 they do very well if they're given the right opportunity, for example. And there are a number of other examples of that whereby, uh, again, the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Research at Melbourne University has bringing that information together in a way which seeds so many other good ideas, which then in turn becomes great public policy. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting, it's interesting, you know, you mentioned about the conversion to metric, and um, I love the story in the book about that this uh, the anti-metric association, this fierce, this fierce lobby group that existed to save us from the perils of, of metricization, or however you say that. Um, look, uh, you know, we're, we're running a little low on time, so what I want to ask now is about, about you know, questions for you. Right, we've got a little time, so I just want to ask one more question, if I yeah. can, and that is just to think about, look, every country has a judiciary, every country has, you know, democratic, or, or, or most, you know, the countries have a democratic system, have political leaders. I want to think a little bit about what's unique to Australia. So in the book, you make the case in several instances that Australia is leading the world and got this world's best practice PBS, world's best practice X system, you know? So what is it about Australia that makes us be able to do that? And then I sort of reflect, all right, so we could do these reforms. We can introduce GST, but we can't introduce a carbon tax. So what is it about Australia? Is it something we had and we're losing? Or is it something that, that, that's there that's part of Australia? And I'd just like to take all of you if I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, in a word, until recently, the Murdoch media, um, they were against the carbon tax because they were amplifying the concerns of the resources sector. Um, I noticed that, um, what's his name? Um, can't remember. Uh, the, no, 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 the... the former minister who is now the head of the resources. McFarlane. Yeah, McFarlane was rasping out the other day that they're going to empower a $40 million campaign against the government if they dare affect, touch their super profits, to which I think the Labor Party, the Labor government's reaction is going to be great, fine, you know, pump $40 million into advertising. That's great for the economy. Go right ahead. You're not going to slow us down because you guys have been raking it in. And that's great. I mean, I think that's really to see a government that's emboldened as we are seeing is very encouraging. Um, but the Murdoch media has been a handbrake on reform on a whole lot of things. There are things they support, so they get done, and there are things that they stop. But as we're seeing here in particular, I mean, Dan Andrews staring down the, the, the Murdoch media and 3AW in the last, you know, six of his eight years in power has emboldened other premiers and the federal colleagues as well to rethink the kind of Alan Jones approach, the shock jock approach. I mean, basically the shock jocks are, you know, self-important people with short attention spans, but um, they, they need to be put in their place and they need to be belittled sometimes as do the editors of the tabloids. And that's what just happened this last weekend and that hasn't been lost on anybody. So I, th I think we'll see a government that's much more prepared. And we've seen this disaggregation in the media. And I mean, I could talk about this for hours, but you don't have the gatekeepers you used to have. It's not as centralised. It's now much more fragmented. Anyone in this room can spend an afternoon buying some technology, learning how to use it, read the manual, go on YouTube and you become a publisher. You can publish a blog, you can publish a podcast, you can publish whatever you like, you can start telling the world, as have thousands and thousands of people, what you think progress looks like. Uh, finding an audience is completely different. 
and not everyone can do that. But you have that capacity and that potential. But what it has meant is that the, the media is cannibalising itself and you don't have that commonality anymore of, of public opinion, the city, you know, the city square, the, you know, the, the water cooler conversation, those have all fragmented as well. So it's a very different landscape. Some people are coming out of it winners and some people are coming out of it just irrelevant. So, so just briefly, and this is looking really back over the last 100 years, why has Australia brought in so many innovations from, you know, beginning with the old age pension in the early 1900s right through to the present? I think because we're a young country and we're continually being rejuvenated because we've got such a high immigration rate that it's sort of like makes us dynamic. I mean, look, I'm not a political scientist, but that's just my intuitive uh, guess. John's going to say young, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, I, I don't think it's a coincidence. And I think actually you can actually define why it is that countries actually succeed and others don't. And I think we've, we've talked about some of them today that we've tried to cover in our book, but almost every one of them has what, what I would call a cogent idea. Every one of them has somehow created a broad sort of institutional framework that allows that cogent idea to take hold. Almost every one of these ideas has created a series of organisations that actually find a way by which those cogent ideas can be implemented. And every one of those ideas has had some masterful agents, powerful principal agents that have supported both the organisations and the ideas to get things done. So I think there are elements of the way by which what we've tried to define here is that it's not just serendipitous. Some of it's serendipitous, but behind it, what generally forms is a sort of an organisation, a loosely knit organisation that brings about that sort of important change because of the cogency of the idea in the first place. But don't all countries have ideas, Bill? And what, what about Brexit? That was an idea. Yes, but, but the point I'm making is not the idea of itself. It's the idea combined with other things that actually enables the reality of that good idea to actually take hold in people's lives. Okay. All right. So um, we've got a little, a little longer, but um, there is some time left for questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and just wait a moment for the, the mic. Is this the, is this the mic? Yeah, sure. That's the mic. Thank you. During the last 10,000 years of human evolution, there have been numerous product innovations, economic innovations, idea innovations, and so on. It seems to happen among certain people, certain places, and certain times. Certainly, randomness of nature has something to do with it. But a big part of it, in my view, is some people seem to have certain psychological, physiological traits which enables it to happen. Now, my question is not why some people have it and some people don't. That's a wicked question. But my question is, what are those physiological or psychological traits which enable such innovations to happen in some places among some people, but not in others? That's for you, Beth. That's definitely for you. Uh, look, if I knew, I would write another book. I mean, I think that's a great question. <laughs> um, I don't know. I really don't know. And I, 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 ca I can see that people are willing to change their minds, obviously. I mean, that must be one thing. But what, what leads some groups of people to be more flexible in their thinking and others more rigid? I really don't know. But... I'm sure John will know. <laughs> he knows everything. Um, anthropology <laughs> has taught us uh, a lot of the time, though, the answer comes in conquest and physical might. 
um, you know, there were great innovations and civilizations that have been lost to us over the thousands of years. And the assertion in particular from the colonial period of the English empire, but along with the colonial conquest of other European powers meant that the cultural imposition of their view of the world overwhelmed a lot of extinct, a lot of other now extinct civilizations who had also innovated. And as you travel, when you go and study ancient civilizations, you know, the Mongolians were extraordinary. And you go to Mongolia and they say, we want to be great again. It's not just Donald Trump who came up with that. Um, I've had the benefit of traveling. Every country says it. And, you know, I've had the benefit of going to Uzbekistan, you know, Kyrgyzstan, you know, wherever you go, people say we were a great people once and we will be great again. There were great empires in, in Laos, in Cambodia. China is not one civilization, it's dozens of them that competed. And the Han ended up swamping the others, but there are enormous stories to be told of successful subcultures in what we regard as modern China. I mean, you know, Italy's a relatively recent creation. The country of Italy didn't exist. Germany didn't exist a couple of, you know, not that long ago. 250, 300 years ago, and so on. So there's a lot of what we regard as the world now <coughs> ought not be taken at that at face value. And, and uh, you know, the Incas had a rich civilization; it was almost wiped out. Um, the British wiped out. We don't even know what they wiped out in a civilization here in Australia that had little re written record. But you know, even this week, we've learned that they're now excavating all sorts of sites. I mean, we all we all grew up being told that. Indigenous Australians were nomads and had no connection to land. And now we're discovering settled farms in Western, Western Victoria in Budge Bim. You know, there's, there's stone huts, eel traps, and it's a complete contradiction of everything we thought we knew. So, you know, it's a great question, but it's beyond the scope of what we're doing now, I think. I have no idea. The only thing I can say, though, is that when, when, when I was writing what I, in, in conjunction with Beth, the thing that struck me was that Australia has had a number of people who acted in the common good. For whatever reason, they acted in the common good. The point I made about Henderson, Henderson gained nothing out of, out of devoting his life to poverty. Uh, um, uh, Beth, Beth has written about a number of people who devoted their lives during certainly a concentrated period to find a way to garnish wages so that kids who were left in poverty could actually get some benefit. And there are a whole range of examples of that where people, for whatever reason, have decided to put aside their own self-interest and act in the common good. All right. Uh, yeah. yeah, so look, we're actually out of time now, but uh, there, there will be time, there is... After this, there will be uh, uh, refreshments and snacks and drinks downstairs, so we can continue the conversation then. Can I just invite Steve to come up and offer a vote of thanks to John and the authors? Thanks, Russell, and thanks very much to all the panellists for a very interesting discussion and uh, to uh, Beth and Bill on the, the book, And uh, but these presents are particularly for John, so uh, thanks very much for your talk. It was very interesting and, uh, yeah, for, for the uh, discussions that sparked as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. It's pretty heavy. <laughs> thank you. All right. So, yeah, as I said, there will be a reception downstairs in the foyer and I hope very much you can join us. Uh, thanks so much for coming tonight. Um, there'll also be a stand with with copies of the book and, you know, having, you know, if you work in public policy, if you're interested in public policy, um, I personally recommend it. It's a terrific, terrific read. Thanks so much.